All right. Awesome. Mahalo, Beth, and mahalo, everybody, for joining us today. I'm really excited for this presentation. Um, and this is actually the last presentation of our Maui Nui mini series for the Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. So um, hope you guys got to join in on some of these great presentations throughout the week. If you missed any, you can check out our Facebook um, on the Maui Invasive Species Committee uh, Facebook site. Um, to watch some of these other presentations that we've had. I think we had about uh, nine total this week. So go and check them out. Uh, but today I would like to introduce to you Adam Radford. His first experience with MISC was as an intern in 2005, working on a project to address banana bunchy top virus. He's worked as the vertebrate, vertebrate crew leader, MISC's operation manager, and in 2016, he became the MISC manager. So he is the captain steering our ship in protecting Maui against invasive species, um, has a wealth of knowledge, and also just want to put a plug if we have any students or interns in the audience, Adam is a great example of how dedication, passion, hard work, and growing your own leadership skill set can bring you from being, you know, a volunteer or intern to then running the organization. So. Uh, without further ado, I just want to say mahalo, Adam, for joining us today and take it away. Thanks, Serena, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, can you hear me okay? Am I coming through all right? Yep. Okay, Sounds great. Good. Well, yeah, so I realized I bit off a little more than I was prepared for with this presentation because there's so much to it. But so what I'm going to present is actually a pretty cursory introduction to MISC and MOMISC responses to unique vertebrates in Maui County mainly, but I put in a lot of things that are applicable both statewide and then also perhaps tools and lessons learned that might be relevant to a broader audience, um, not just those working on Maui Nui. And so okay, so it's uh, this is the main question that comes to mind for me when addressing uh, any new species that you're trying to deal with is, did we get them all if you decide to take that on? And that's a really complex question to answer because you might have situations where there's one thing and, and it's pretty definitive if you got it or not, but you might have others where um, there's many and it's hard to determine if you got them all or not. And then there's also, I guess my short answer to that question would be no. You never got them all because there's always new things showing up and I'll talk more about that a little bit throughout the presentation, but I think what I'm presenting is more <clears throat> an approach to addressing those new things that show up with some examples from here in Maui County. So what I'm going to discuss is the problem with new arrivals, um, not in a lot of detail per um, species. So I'm going to give some examples, as I mentioned, of specifics that have happened in Maui County, but I'm not going to go so much into the natural history. There's a lot of um, peer review information on, on all the things I'm going to discuss today. So if you just essentially Google um, like Snakes Hawaii, for example, you'll find a plethora of information on it. So I'm not getting into that too much, but more just uh, what the problem was, what we did and what we learned. And so I wanna discuss also, this is more relevant to a statewide approach is amnesty versus action. Uh, early detection and rapid response, and as I mentioned, case studies from Maui Nui, and then some conclusions and recommendations with opportunity for questions um, after my presentation. So the problem with new arrivals, this is me when I first came to Hawaii in this picture in the upper right-hand corner. I'd been at sea for about 16 days and showed up um, shirtless on an inflatable pineapple. So you can see a lot of problems with that. But um, as I got here, I realized I might be competing with native species for food. Um, new arrivals often use native species as food, particularly when we're discussing vertebrate introductions. They have the potential to destroy landscapes if you've seen any of the pictures of uh, ungulate damage, for example, and where there's a fence line protecting more pristine native forest and in areas that are not protected, it's pretty dramatic difference. Um, Non-native species, particularly vertebrates, are known to um, spread non-native, other non-native species, particularly plant species uh, and diseases. And of course, pose a threat to human health and quality of life and can be very costly in so many ways, whether that's cost for a program or individual trying to address a new introduction um, or just again to our quality of life. For example, 
like snakes and frogs and other things like that are well known for causing uh, power outages and a variety of other things that are can result in astronomical costs. So an uh, ounce of prevention is worth a lot in your long-term um, outcome. So amnesty versus action. I think this is really important to highlight, particularly with vertebrates. So as it says here, animals such as snakes, large reptiles, wild predatory mammals, invasive bird species, and non-native mammals are legal in Hawaii. And the state's amnesty program allows the voluntary surrender of illegal animals with no penalties assessed if a person turns those in before an investigation is initiated. So this is a, like you get out of jail free card because this is probably the most cited um, penalty for possession of illegal animals. And that's an important point is this is talking about possession of illegal animals. So this is you, you brought your pet snake to Hawaii. You didn't know that was a problem, but you wanna keep it. You cannot have a snake in Hawaii. Otherwise, if you are found to have that snake um, and you do not utilize the amnesty option, you can be fined up to $200,000 imprisoned for not more than three years and ultimately pay for all costs relating to the capture or eradication of the pest. So if you're like, oh man, the cops are at my door to get my snake and you let it out the window and then uh, we and other programs have to go find it, you're uh, essentially liable for those costs. What's interesting about this and not cited as often is the importation of animals to Hawaii, which has much stricter laws and much greater fines. So I would encourage you not to do that. Admittedly, there, the, the breakdown here is um, in the um, utilization of these laws and fines, it, it, it requires someone to go through a legal process essentially to enact these, these penalties. And so that, that can be quite a process and, and ultimately is not the route that not just the Maui Invasive Species Committee or Molokai Maui Invasive Species Committee wanna go, it's more, we typically try to work from a cooperative standpoint, but it is nice to know that we have these, these tools in our pockets essentially if needed. And when I say R, uh, MISC or MOMISC don't have the ability to access private property without permission, nor do we have the ability to find individuals that would fall more to departments like Department of Agriculture. So early detection and rapid response, this is the best bang for your buck, right? And so, a couple um, key elements of that for, for our staff is training, and that training can be formal. So, for example, for snake trainings, we send people to Guam, actually, where brown tree snakes are a huge problem, to receive a very formal, very thorough training on early detection, um, handling of snakes, identification of snakes, and also a pretty formal process in terms of deciding if a report you got is valid or not, and then also deciding upon a course of action. And then for, there's sort of two types of reports that come in. There's, there's a report from someone in the public. So that could be something they saw. Um, it could be something they heard about. And then there's also observations, which are those that are often made by our staff um, or partner kind of environmental professional individuals who make an observation that, that may be deemed credible um, quite quickly because perhaps that person has a great amount of experience dealing with say like panthers in, in their native range or uh, snakes in Guam for many years. And as I mentioned, um, reporting, the, these are just two avenues, but I wanna highlight the snake one because at the end of the day, this is actually a great tool for us is if you know no one else to call, you can actually call the police department and, and they'll pass the report along to the appropriate party. And then for statewide reporting, the 63 pest, 643 pest outlet is, is I think the most um, efficient and also again applicable to everyone within the state. So you can call the phone number or use the 643pest.org um, app and or online uh, option for reporting. And really at the end of the day, like the public is our greatest asset in terms of reporting because there's thousands of people all over Hawaii outside um, seeing things that, you know, our limited staff may not be seeing or hearing. So again, if you see something, say something. I like with the snake reporting, actually, it's more than see something, say something, it's uh, see something, kill it. So if you can do that safely, that's would be wonderful. Um, again, the key word there being do that or words being do that safely. 
Um, so if we receive a report, there's an interview process and that process can be um, formal or informal. As I mentioned, there's trainings on that. Um, then we investigate, take action or not, and uh, there's outreach and follow up. I'm gonna elaborate on those just a little bit more. So a formal interview might be a very um, scripted interview like the ones we use for snake reports. In those reports, we actually will sit down with the reporter and run through a series of questions that help us determine is the report valid or not? And then also what might we be dealing with? An informal interview would be more like someone calls 643 Pest or calls the Maui Invasive Species Committee and we talk on the phone about what they've seen or heard. And, and then we may go into a more formal um, assessment from there, or we may say, well, what you heard was actually your fire alarm in your house needs a new battery. So it just depends on the situation, but it always starts with um, basically like a talk story session to, to try to determine what someone saw. If you're reporting though, it is quite helpful if you can capture pictures, video, provide things in those pictures that um, give scale. So like a quarter next to what you saw, if it's say not alive. Um, so reporting again is probably the most important element to get this all started. Regardless of whether you're investigating during a, a interview um, or out in the field, what you're doing is basically making an initial assessment. So it's what did, who, what, where, when essentially is the, what you're getting at. And often with vertebrates, what we'll do is then um, an initial survey, like a site survey to see if we find anything that might be credible and provide support towards someone seeing, say, a big cat in a gulch near their house. Um, or you find like a snake skin, well, that ramps up your um, reaction to the, the report. And also, as things evolve, and perhaps, you know, we're learning more and a report becomes more and more credible, often we'll do additional interviews with the initial reporter, as well as others that may have seen um, the alleged critter that we're after. And then ultimately, though, as an organization, we need to take action or not. So or not would be we get to the conclusion that it probably wasn't, say, like a snake, but it was a piece of eucalyptus bark blowing across the road in a sinewy way. And so could have looked like a snake, but probably wasn't. And that's going to help um, you determine your next course of action and what level of response you're going to um, utilize. So then as you move forward, outreach and follow up, regardless of your decision is, is critical. And outreach is a kind of a, a interesting one because that's a, actually a tool that can be used very effectively to garner more information about what may have been seen or found. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in one of our case studies, but sometimes it's also, um, you have to be careful with outreach because if say you, you put a, um, article out in the paper saying, you know, we saw a giraffe at Koki, above Koki Beach in Hana, a lot of people might flock to Koki Beach looking for the giraffe. And so even though it may or may not be there. So anyway, outreach has to be well thought out and your message is well crafted to try to really address the question you're trying to answer. And maybe that question is just informing the public, which is fine. Um, or the reporter getting back to them and saying that's the follow up component, you know, well, this is what we decided, please, you know, keep your eyes or ears open and let us know if you see or hear this thing again and we'll we'll follow up and also then again saying well try to capture even more information like if you can get a picture or a video or anything like that if you do see this or hear this again that helps support you know our next again course of action. So regardless of your decision, follow-up is always critical and key because these people obviously took the time to submit a report and express perhaps concern or inquiry about what is it. And so it's just, um, it's good practice to follow up with them. And as I mentioned, these are some examples of more formal interview, um, inter interview components and also actually the forms that go with them. And so in the upper right, is the actual interview or the beginning of it for a snake report. And then the, as you're going through the interview process, there's actually a snake 
sighting interview kit, which has a variety of props essentially that help determine the color of the animal that was seen, the size, the shape, uh, all the details that help to determine what kind of animal may or may not have been seen because that's gonna help dictate an appropriate response if one is warranted. So for example, like it may be a snake that's only active in the day or it's one that's only active at night. So of course you're gonna wanna craft your response around those considerations. So getting into case studies um, on Maui, and again, I'm not gonna go really into the, the biology of each of these species, but more just um, some rough details and, and lessons learned and just observations. So on Maui, at least um, two species of naturalized, that's mitered conures and lovebirds. So assessments and conclusions were actually quite different for each species and then outreach and research were key components of each effort. And so Conyers were actually released on, intentionally released on Maui, um, I think in the 1980s, I think 86. And um, lovebirds came much later. So both of these, it's an interesting point also is that these were, um, one was a deliberate release, one was an accidental release. So these were animals that were at the time allowed in the state and um, in the one intentional release, one accidental. The intentional, they re released a pair of breeding conures and then they um, ultimately became around 200 mitered conures. And then with the lovebirds that we're not sure for certain, but it seems that the lovebirds were the result of a um, aviary falling into disrepair and then ultimately the birds escaped and then became naturalized in on Maui. And so the assessment portion um, for each was sort of similar. It was determining, you know, the extent of the problem, how many animals were there, what was the range of these animals and what was the temperament of the community. And then the research around it was because the temperament in each community was fairly similar in both communities most people did not want to have the animals removed. Um, and so that was really the research component, especially with the mitered conures. A, a lot of different things were tried to recapture the birds, even though the population kept growing um, and nothing worked. So opportunities were given to community groups that wanted to try to capture the birds. Um, anyway, a lot of different efforts ensued and, and ultimately, unfortunately, the only um, option for the mitered conures was a lethal um, approach to control. With the lovebirds, they were in a much more residential setting and they're also called lovebirds. So just from a outreach and sort of public perspective, um, that was a hard one to sell to a very populous community, even though we knew they caused problems, um, you know, whether that's destruction to homes and property and agriculture and things like that, um, but they ultimately, we decided not to take on lovebirds as a, a target because we didn't think it was feasible to control them. By the time we investigated, they were so widespread and there were so many in a residential area that just didn't seem, it didn't seem doable. Um, so we provided information to residents that wanted to try to remove birds on their own. Yeah, and it, for example, <laughs> with the lovebirds, they were one of the main um, pastimes of a retirement community in the area was feeding the birds every morning. So it was like just things like that, you know, you have to consider when you're looking at these targets. Lovebirds are actually a fairly small bird as well, as opposed to mitered conures are a fairly large bird and also live in an area where there is a plant called myconia, which is from the same native range as mitered conures. And it was documented that the birds, the parrots were moving this very invasive plant much greater distances than uh, other birds found in the area because of their size and their um, feeding habits and daily activity was, they were covering a really huge range. So much greater threat from an invasive species management perspective. So I mentioned this uh, in passing, but the Mitre Conyer project in particular was a lesson in treading lightly, um, engaging stakeholders um, and utilizing citizen science. This is a lesson for all of our species because again, you know, someone made this observation and took the time to talk with you about it. it, maybe not work with you, but at least they, you know, they're approachable and hopefully. And so in all situations, I would suggest that, you know, if you, 
you can maintain a rapport with your your reporter or reporters even if you don't decide to act upon what you found or not found um hopefully they'll make another report if it's warranted and also you're just building positive relationships um, throughout your community but treading lightly with the conyers that was one where we actually it was an interesting situation. We had um, animal rights activists get really, really involved in that project, which um, was a whole challenge in and of itself, which ultimately was resolved. But um, it was uh, it took many years, almost at least a decade, to work through some of these complexities before starting actual removal of the animals. As I mentioned, with the Conyers, lethal um, a lethal approach ended up being the ultimate path forward, which the only way we found um, effective was wing shooting, which is often the case for particularly large animals, the birds, um, in an interagency effort. So we leveraged our resources as a program and brought in individuals from other um, state entities mainly and nonprofits that worked in conservation and have removed 195 uh, of the animals and we estimate that about 15 remain. So it's been quite successful. I think the reason, the only reason there's still any birds left is that um, our project is a project at the University of Hawaii and we've been on a, um, a firearm stand down as of late. So we haven't been able to finish this project, but hopefully we'll soon with the help of cooperators. So veiled chameleons, this sneaky guy just snuck onto the screen in the upper right hand corner. Um, this was first discovered in 2002. Actually uh, a dead animal was found in uh, West Maui and subsequently a uh, article went out in the paper. So again, utilizing your outreach approach, just, just saying that the animal had been found on Maui. Within two days of the press release, um, a, a report came in and actually people brought in veiled chameleons from a, a very different geographic area that ultimately ended up being the site of a naturalized population of, of veiled chameleons. So this again was an interagency effort, mostly with Department of Agriculture, Department of Land and Natural Resources and the Maui Invasive Species Committee. And in 2002, um, night searches began. In 2006, we actually started a, a research project just to determine how far the animals might move and also were there options for trapping. Um, in, in 2000, by the end of 2008, 206 animals had been removed. Um, importantly, 31 had been removed by residents. So this is again, your citizen science approach where we had really key contacts within the community telling us very clearly like when they were seeing veiled chameleons and also removing them themselves. So we had kind of like real time updates on, on the status of the population. And we have not found um, a veiled chameleon since 2008, which would be the first extirpation of a um, reptile in a naturalized environment uh, anywhere in the world. So pretty exciting. How we did the searches was three days a night, about every six weeks um, for three hours per night with flashlights. And you can see the MISC employees in the center of the screen standing on each other's shoulders with a long pole, trying to get a sleeping veiled chameleon down. Um, although these animals can be quite large, they're also quite cryptic. And so we had a search area based on the, what we knew the movement of the animals to be. Um, but what we, what we did was basically double that with an outreach uh, blitz, blitz, like a PR blitz, as it says here, where we just informed everybody in a quite a large radius of the original site of release, we believe. And um, yeah, like I said, haven't found any since 2008. So very encouraging. And so again, using citizen science on the ground removal efforts, um, outreach and education, kind of all the elements of a successful successful removal of an uh, un unwanted vertebrate pest species. And just quickly, I know I didn't, I said I wouldn't get into natural history, but um, veiled chameleons can basically act like a snake would in a native forest of Hawaii, meaning they quite likely would eat native birds. Uh, these guys, so rabbits, rabbits, are all over the place. So rabbits can be on, kept on Maui, um, but, and you know, they're cute and cuddly, but what's the big deal with rabbits? So as it says here, laws require owners in Hawaii to keep their pets caged and off the ground. Well, why? Um, obviously it keeps pets from escaping and starting wild populations and prevents the spread of 
tularemia, which is a bacterial disease with flu-like symptoms. I thought this would be interested, interesting from a, more of a statewide perspective. These are Hawaii revised statutes. The first one is not very commonly cited. It basically, to me, it turns rabbit hunting into essentially the wild west of vertebrate introductions. If you read it, it basically says that police and others can go and control rabbits if they see them and there's not a clear owner. What mo most often happens though, we've had several rabbits on Maui and Molokai and often you get a rabbit report, they're typically valid because um, rabbits are a very identifiable <laughs> animal. People know what they are and they tend to show up in the same places over and over again. Um, but the second one is more commonly cited and this is um, regarding keeping rabbits. So like if we get a rabbit report, we often find who the owner is and talk to them about the proper way to keep their rabbit and, and often cite this second statute which says that they have to keep them in captivity off the ground. And these are potential um, fines and repercussions if you don't. So with results with rabbits, we're often, we have a long history of, of successfully removing rabbits, not often with lethal um, approaches, but actually finding the owner, returning the rabbit to the owner, or we've worked with like the Humane Society and other vets on Maui to help get rabbits we, we recover um, adopted by someone who is responsible for their care. Snakes on Maui. Um, we've had quite a few snakes show up on Maui. Fortunately, most were dead, um, but a variety, this is a good one from 2019, stowaway snake found slithering from the backpack of a Maui visitor. And that snake, um, the owner was, it was an individual visiting Maui um, who came from Florida and the owner of the place he was staying actually saw the snake um, after it came out of his backpack and called the police. And then they ultimately called um, our really lead rapid responder for snakes on Maui, who's with the Department of Land and Natural Resources and he recovered the snake. Um, but it, it's also a good example of the owner of the property knew that snakes were not supposed to be in Hawaii and took action. And so I just wanted to say one more thing about snakes statewide. So an examination of Hawaii Department of Agriculture records from 1990 to 2000 indicated hundreds of credible snake sightings in the state, mostly of free roaming animals that were not recovered. These snakes arrived primarily through smuggling of pets, but some snakes are accidentally introduced as cargo stowaways, like in a backpack. So again, did you get them all? Probably not. Um, for that 10 year period, there were 236 credible sightings. The um, the one thing I wanted to point out was that um, Let's see, 99 of the 236 went uncaptured. So those are credible reports where 99 uh, never had a conclusion. So where did they go? Who knows? But getting back to the amnesty program, um, the, let's see, how many was it? 74. Um, were captive animals that were surrendered surrendered voluntarily, so under the Department of Ag's and Amnesty program, or confiscated by their personnel. So that shows that that program works. But anyway, for snake response for Maui, we've had several several responses that have been multi-week efforts to short efforts, and those efforts will include searching at night for snakes or during the day, if appropriate, uh, use of game cameras and traps, and results. Um, most of the snakes we've recovered were like the example of the stowaway snake, where the snake was pretty much where it was first sighted and it was recovered right away. So early detection, rapid response. Somebody saw it, somebody got there right away, somebody got it. That's the most common. When we've had snake sightings in the wild, if you will, um, we have not been very successful and neither have other programs throughout the state, in my opinion. It's very difficult once a snake is established um, in an environment. They're very cryptic and they can move quite easily um, to places where you just can't find them. So it's a challenge. So again, that also emphasizes the point about um, your reporters staying in touch with them. And even if you abandon you know, your effort to try to find the snake, asking them if they see it again, to please let you know and get back to, to them. And then I wanted to highlight 
the availability of the USGS brown tree snake rapid response team. They're based largely in Guam. Um, we have trained searchers through that program here in Hawaii as well, but this network of trained individuals are, are available to help with craft your response as well as help go search. Again, that can be costly in terms of your decision making if you choose to bring a rapid response team, say, from Guam to help you, say, on Maui, which actually happened, I believe it was 2003 or four in East Maui. We had a valid report of a brown tree snake. We spent several weeks out there searching with the assistance of folks from Guam. I wanted to bring this up relatively quickly is the use of airsoft electrical guns for control of invasive reptiles. This actually has applicability to invasive vertebrates in general. It's a hobby grade toy air gun and it's not regulated. So this is helpful if you needed to say travel to the site of a report um, of a snake or other relatively small vertebrate. Um, some details about it, but it's um, it's a, used as a, um, it's kind of the new paintball if you're not familiar with airsoft guns. Um, and the main point though is, is it effective on essentially control of, of brown tree snakes is where the main body of literature rests, but it, it did prove quite effective, especially if used uh, within 12 meters of the animal. And the picture kind of shows one example of why you might want it. Like in the at the end of the day, to me, it's like, you just can't get to an animal you're seeing. And so this is a tool to help say, bring it down from a high perch, or if it's in dense vegetation that you believe if you disturb that vegetation, you're gonna lose sight of the animal. So this is a very effective tool with a broad range of applicability and very little um, legal paperwork, I guess is the easy way to put it around utilization of it. And also being able to have this tool with you if you need to travel. So. Some conclusions is prevention is your best strategy, of course, and just hats off to our Department of Agriculture who do an incredible job of screening things as they come into the state and, and try to intercept um, not just snakes or other vertebrates, but a wide range of, of invasive species. So early detection rapid response is your next best course of action. Um, if you make a game plan, my recommendation is to stick to it and assess as you go. So if you decide with the input of others that you're gonna search for say three weeks, you have to stick to that and assess as you go through the process. Because even say, if you find one animal, there might be more, that's a conversation you would have to have with your team. Um, the other thing that's really helpful for us when you're trying to answer that question of, did we get them all? Is, you know, you need to look at like your searcher efficacy. So for the veiled chameleons, um, we actually had searchers document other, um, reptiles and amphibians and just other things they were seeing to try to gauge search efficacy. So we knew that they were seeing actually a very similar animal called a Jackson's chameleon, um, but they weren't finding veiled chameleons, which just said, told us, you know, they're, they're still finding chameleons, but our number of veiled chameleons clearly has gone way down while the number, number of Jackson's chameleons is, that we're finding has stayed relatively the same. It seems that we're having a very clear impact on the population there. So having measures to show progress along the way is very helpful in your decision making as well as keeping staff motivated because searcher fatigue is a very real thing. If you're going out night after night in hot, buggy, wet, steep, thick terrain vegetation, it can get tiring. So helping keep people motivated is really important. Um, be data driven and systematic in your approach. Again, I talked about public involvement quite a bit, keep the public involved, um, leverage your resources. That's where I talked about with Maui, we're fortunate. And I think throughout the state where we're able to work with partners to make a determination on what people saw as well as um, act upon that if we need to and draw in those resources to help, to help leverage ours. And I think finding creative solutions to lethal approaches is a really good avenue if, if it's possible. So for example, some amnesty programs, they, they ensure that if you turn in your pet snake that you've had for years and you grew up with, it will not be euthanized, which that's an incentive for some people. Other incentives are things like, some of these animals are beautiful animals that could serve a purpose for outreach and education um, in zoos or other maybe other creative alternatives to lethal approaches. And then summarize your findings and debrief with your crew, staff, and partners, and also share your lessons learned 
So others um, in maybe similar environments or situations can take what you've learned and perhaps utilize those lessons and or improve upon them and then take a break. Uh, responses to invasive species, particularly invasive vertebrate species, can be really taxing and time consuming and long days and hours. So you definitely deserve a break after going through a response to, um, to one of these animals. And just wanted to mahalo um, the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, Department of Land and Natural Resources, Hawaii Invasive Species Council, County Maui, the USGS Brown Tree Snake Rapid Response Team, uh, USDA APHIS Wildlife Research Center, and US Fish and Wildlife Service, and just highlight the MISC and MOMISCA projects of the Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit, University of Hawaii. That's the end of my presentation, and mahalo for your time. Happy to take any questions. Awesome, mahalo nui, Adam. So if anybody has any questions, you can insert it in the question and answer um, tab in the Zoom, or you can put it in the comment section on Facebook Live. Uh, we do have one question on Facebook from Zach Radford, wondering if there's any relation there. Um, he's asking, what are some recommended creative ways to see something and kill it when it comes to snakes? Uh, machete works pretty well, or a big rock, or a two by four, or a car. All right, awesome. Yeah, the other thing I would say, good question, Mr. Redford, um, is that also, if you know, if you can't kill it or don't want to, sometimes people can trap an animal, like snakes in particular, like if you just kind of corner it somewhere and quarantine the area until help arrives, that's another approach because one thing with animals is again safety certainly don't want to put anyone at risk trying to capture uh, an animal that may be venomous or carry a disease that you don't want and so we certainly want people to be active but not put themselves at risk and the main thing though is if you do nothing except for you see this animal and you you're on your cell phone making a report is to keep your eye on the animal if you can, or have someone keep their eye on the animal so that when help arrives, you can be like, it's right there. I see it, it's right there. So that's just another um, pro tip, I guess, for reporting. Yeah, great advice. I think if I saw a snake, I would definitely get in my car and try to run it over and stay as far away as I can from something like that. Um, Earl Campbell on Facebook says, thanks for a great talk. Anybody else have questions here in Zoom um, or on Facebook Live? We've got Fern Duvall in the house. Um, he says, ID is important, maybe a venomous snake in rare cases. So definitely important. Um, in that we don't want any venomous snakes running around in our community. Um, Randy Bartlett says, awesome presentation, Adam. Keep up the great work, everyone at MISC. Thanks, Randy. Anyone else got questions for Adam? I just had a quick comment. I, uh, if you can, can you see my screen still? Yeah. So this is Dr. Fern Duvall making an identification of a veiled chameleon um, some years ago. Oh, yep, there he is on the top right. <laughs> walking his talk, walking his talk. Good job, Fern. Good point, Fern. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Adam, for this awesome presentation. I feel like um, we could spend an hour talking about these topics and all of these different species. And it's kind of an exciting part of the job too when um, these kind of reports come in. So just a reminder that a lot of the reports of invasive species populations come from the community. So you folks are extremely important in being the eyes and the ears out there, letting us know if something looks suspicious or off, or you know it's not supposed to be there. 643pest.org is a really great resource to use. And Beth right over here is the one who checks it and will get back to you promptly. So just remember um, 643pest.org um, and report it, report it, report it.